Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone, if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I greatly appreciate it. We have Lori on the podcast. She's coming to us all the way from Quebec. Might be our second guest on from Quebec. I'm pretty sure we've had one before, but it's always nice to have guests on from, you know, all parts of North America, basically. And then we get some Europeans and Australians on as well. But She's a complete psychopath. If I'm going to say this first off, she is a bodybuilder as, as well as a pastry chef, which I mean, to have that kind of willpower, that's going to be about half of our conversation right there because that is just absolutely ridiculous. But first off, Lori, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, before we just dive right into the whole pastry chef being a bodybuilder thing, to start off, why don't you just first off, give us your story on what inspired and motivated you to become a bodybuilder first off. Uh, well, I am, um, 44 years old and I have three children, three boys. And, uh, at one point in my life, I was quite, uh, hefty, we'll call it. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I got into the gym just to basically get in, in shape and, you know, lose the, the weight. And then I fell in love with the gym and it was it started more as my escape and rather than, you know, the getting in shape thing, it was lose the weight and just have time for yourself. And then, you know, as you start seeing results, it starts to become slightly bit of an obsession. And, um, I got a coach at one point and he was always asking me, do you ever want to compete? Do you ever want to compete? And I, I had no, absolutely no, no, I didn't want to do it. I, I had a very, um, not a bad view of it, but like my view of it was, it's very selfish. Like, why would people want to do that? Uh, you know, it's a show off. And, um, so it was out of my head. It was just get in shape, train with the trainer, have fun and have this escape. And, um, I don't know, just two years ago, I'd been training already for about 10, 12 years. And I was at a point where, you know, I, I could do it. And, and I wasn't far out to be able to prep for it. And so I said to my coach, like, just train me as if I would do a competition. I said, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to get on stage. I'm not the girliest of girls, like wearing a bikini in front of people and heels was not ever something I would have wanted to do. And, um, he said, well, you know, if you, if you do it, you'll win. And I said, yeah, okay. That's not my goal. I said, um, I just want to have the confidence to know that I could do this. And so, yeah, he, I said, okay, let's do it. And he said, well, you have six weeks. And I was like, six weeks? <laughs> I said, don't people like train for these things for like six months or a year? And he said, oh, no, you'll be good. Six weeks, six weeks. And I was like, okay, let's just let's try. And yeah, so I did that six-week prep. It was one of the most, um, <laughs> let's say, I want to say it was it wasn't the most difficult thing I ever did, but mentally to, you know, get really strong and tough and, um, yeah, baking at the same time and cooking for my kids and, you know, so yeah, it was, it was more the preparation and being able to do all of that than actually getting to the stage. And, um, then I I ended up winning. I won my first competition ever and uh, it was a regional competition. So I qualified to go to a national competition. And, you know, I had said to my coach, I'm doing this once, you know, I'm 43 years old. I I don't have it in me to do it again. And he said, well, you know, you qualify for nationals, right? And I said, oh yeah, let's do it. (laughs) So (laughs) I ended up doing it again a couple of weeks later to nationals and I did win nationals as well. And, um, there was the, you know, the pro card that you could get. And I, in my head, I said, Oh, I don't need a pro card. I just want to win this nationals. And then I didn't win the pro card. So yeah, this summer I went back to nationals and I did win. I got my gold medal, but I did not get the pro card. So next summer I'm going back <laughs> and that's my, uh, yeah, it just, 
I don't know. I thought I wasn't going to like it. I thought it was vain. And um, it really teaches you a lot about yourself. And I just loved it. I loved it. <laughs> so how long were you into baking? Was it much before you became a bodybuilder? Or what was yeah. your journey with baking? I have been baking for 25 years. I straight out of high school, I always knew I wanted to be in the pastry field from when I was a little kid. And yeah, I graduated high school. I went to culinary school. I worked in restaurants and hotels and pastry stores. And then I went to pastry school. And um, yeah, I've been working in that for the past 25 years. Um, when I had my kids, I decided to step back a bit and I started my own business from home, um, making cakes and I do desserts for reception halls. And so basically I bake every single day and I cook for three teenage boys. <laughs> I'm always in front of cake, sugar, cookies, Nutella, you name it. It's there, chocolates. Uh, I have like literal shelves filled with chocolate. And then I was like, oh, let's give yourself a challenge. <laughs> let's become a bodybuilder. <laughs> so. well, let's just get right into it. How in the hell do you do that? Because I just don't have that willpower. Like That's why I love talking to some of these guests because I just don't have that in me to like not just – I would work out. I could do all the workouts. Like That's easy enough. But like I would just carb the hell up on whatever you were making pastry-wise. So how do you, <laughs> how do, you do it? Because that to me is just the – craziest thing about this whole story I think once you really set your mind to do something like that um you you can you know like a lot of people say oh I can never do it I can never do it but once you really put your mind with that goal and that's what you want um it it is a bit easier to um, I don't know easier is the wrong word because yeah it was really hard I'm not gonna lie uh, there was days where I just had my face in the bucket of peanut butter and I was like, I just want to eat this whole bucket. And, and I'm, I slipped up a few times. I'm not going to lie. I had my moments where, you know, you, you, you're working and then you lick your finger and you're like, Oh my God, the Nutella tastes so good. And then you just grab a spoon and you're like, Oh my God, what did I do? And you call your coach. Like I just ate half a bucket of Nutella. And he's like, Oh my God. Um, I think it really is about mindset though. Once you really set your mind to that goal, you will do it because we do what we want to do. Right. So yeah, um, it was not easy at all. And I found it actually more difficult in cooking for my kids and preparing dinners and, you know, going to like family functions than the actual work. Cause I guess the work is just the habit, um, you know, and people often say, well, don't you get, you must be tired of having your own stuff. And I'm like, no, it's so good. <laughs> I'm not. So, but I think the mindset is the most important thing. Once you put that goal in place, uh, you'll do whatever it takes to get there. And, and as difficult as it was to look at all the big goods and the food and everything, I just I had a goal. Now we get to the food porn part of the podcast. What is your favorite thing to cook or bake? <gasps> Uh, you know what? My favorite thing to cook. A lot of people ask me that, like, what's my favorite dessert? What's my favorite thing to cook? Um, you know, we're Italian. So the Sunday sauce is one thing that, um, you know, is my favorite for sure. And not just because of the taste of it and how good it is, the, uh, the, the meaning of it. It brings the family together. But for me, like if I go out or if I get a cheat or if I'm going to really indulge, it's steak, like a medium rare steak cooked perfectly with French fries. That's my, my go-to. Like, I don't want a hamburger, you know, bodybuilders. A lot of them are like, Oh, the, the cheat meal is a hamburger. I'm like, no, I don't want a hamburger. I want steak. <laughs> yep, I got a little Italian in me. I think I'm only like 12% though, but my mom was, <laughs> my mom was like half or a quarter. And my, my, one of my grandparents was, I think full Italian, but so every Saturday or Sunday, I believe we would always have the spaghetti and the, you know, we did, or we do roast beef or something like that, but it would be a traditional, most Italian meal. So that was, I, so that when you said that sauce and the, oh God, that's just bringing back memories right now. We still, we do it every once in a while now, but like that is, and then we do, um, we do like crabs for Christmas Eve. Apparently that's like a Catholic yeah. Italian thing. So we do that as well. But yeah, that stuff is, 
insanely good. But now we get to the bodybuilding part. I mean, everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much when they first get started. <laughs> and then everyone always has that one body part that just drags behind it. They have to train to oblivion. What was one body part that really took off for you? And what's been one body part that you've said to drag behind? My shoulders were or my strong point. I had really good. We can shoulders. see them through your sweater basically too. So that just, that just goes to show like you can't hide when you're that in shape. House, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People would ask me if I, they're like, Oh, do you inject your shoulders? And I'm like, this what? So I'm like, no, I just have really good genetics on my shoulders. Yep. That's all it takes so, everyone. You just inject the shoulder and it just pops. Yeah. That's, the Sorry. ignorance of a lot of people is, is it's hilarious at times. You're just like, really? Come on. Yeah. And my, my, Hardest part was my legs. Uh, my legs really dragged me on. I had a hard time losing the fat on my legs and um, like getting the, the cuts. Like from my first, second, and third competition, the most huge difference is my legs. And uh, they will be even better for the next one. <laughs> I've said this a billion times, but I'm 6'3", so I know completely what you're talking about when it comes to legs. We're good God. You know, I could... Like the people said, I could literally inject pure muscle into my legs and, you know, good luck. Good luck, everyone. But, yeah. you know, yeah, that is just ridiculous. But having that background in, you know, being cooking and working in, you know, pastry, did that help you at all when it came to the nutritional changes that you had to make in this sport or did it? Because just I, I don't know. I would imagine maybe having just a little bit of a background just in the food industry might help. But did you think it helped you out at all or was it a hindrance or how did it, how did being in the food industry impact your bodybuilding? I feel like it did help because, um, like I went to culinary school and everyone that that's another thing that everyone thinks we only eat chicken and broccoli and rice. Right. And I was like, Oh, it's so boring. Your food is so boring. I'm like, well, I'm a chef. And so like, even my coach would say, it. he's like, you, you know how to cook. I don't have to tell you what to put in your food. So my food tasted really good. Okay. After a while eating the same thing over and over was, was boring, but, um, I think it did help me because, you know, I could spice things differently and I knew how to kind of like at the beginning of your prep, you can kind of swap things out here and there towards the end. You can't, it's really weighed and measured, but I know how to spice my food properly. So I was never like, Oh my God, this is such a boring meal. It was, it always tasted good. It was more like, I just don't want to eat this again. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely did help for sure. How do you deal with the baking or just the cooking part in general when you're on prep? Because when your brain gets a little foggy sometimes, I mean, for especially when you're doing like decorations or frosting, you got to be like so down pat. How do you deal with the brain fog that could come to be? Because I could imagine that would maybe lead to some funny moments cooking. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I think the, the, the most thing is really like being prepared and having your meals ready and having everything done and prepped and uh, towards the end, the brain fog it affects everything. I mean, every, I, I found it hard to get through my work because like something that would literally take me, you know, 10 to 15 minutes or a small amount of time normally on prep, it was like dragging and dragging. I was like, you don't feel like doing it and you're tired and you know, you're sore here or you're sore there or you're, you're hungry and you're like, I don't want to decorate this cake. I want to eat it. <laughs> My dog is going crazy too at this moment. No worries. Again, you can't you can't do anything about dogs. They're dogs. I mean, let's let's be completely honest. At least, hey, at least you don't have a Siberian husky. I had one podcast where they barked literally the entire time, and I I looked it over and I'd call him. I messaged him. I'm like, I'm sorry. I literally just can't release this because like people would be so annoyed. So we're gonna have to redo it. So then we ended up just redoing it, and it was fine. But yeah, when it comes to dogs, again, I they're dogs. Everyone, so it's totally it's totally fine. Yeah. What, what do you want? He's ringing the bell to go outside, but then he goes away from the door. I think he's just trying to get my attention. Ours does the same exact thing. Well, our thing actually is that we have a neighbor, literally the house right next to us, where our dog knows that it'll get a treat if the neighbor sees her out there. So she wants to go outside just to sit in the sun and wait for the neighbor to see her. And after like 15 minutes of being so, and then we got to watch her because she's a small dog and there are, there have been dog attacks around here. We live close to a little bit of wildlife, like coyotes and stuff. So we actually like have to keep an eye out on her at all times when she's outside. So it's like, I don't want to sit outside for 15 minutes, just watching you sit waiting for. So yeah, I, I totally, <laughs> totally understand the struggle on that. But bodybuilding is so much more of a mental sport than it is a physical sport. And a lot of people just notice the physical changes just because like they said, you can't really get into someone's mind, but, and they'll just be like, Oh my God, Laura, you look amazing. But how has the sport affected you mentally? Because that mental impact is a hundred times more important than any of the physical changes. I 
percent agree with you there. It really was the most mental thing I've ever done in my life. Um, it, you know, I mean, we we all go to the gym, we work out. I mean, some people just it's a leisure thing. For me, it was more about the escape and just having the time to myself. Like I do, I have three children. I have three teenage boys right now. They're teenagers, you know. And um, good luck with that. Oh God, yeah. So for me, the gym, it didn't really start with, it started with taking care of my body, but it was more that time for myself. And then when I started doing the bodybuilding, it really was about mentally having the the escape, the time for myself. And I really grew a lot. Like you get to know yourself a lot. And then uh, I went through a divorce and, you know, so that kind of, shifted the dynamic of the family and the kids and I never really did anything for myself except the gym so when I really started taking bodybuilding seriously it was really about my mental more than anything else you know and it was it was about being able to do it and having the confidence to do it and like getting to the the point where you have that confidence and you feel good about yourself and um yeah, the, the meal prepping and the, the struggles of the fatigue and everything. And like, for me, it was really just getting to the goal. And I, I didn't care if I won or not. It wasn't even about the medal. It was about, can I push myself to do this for myself and feel good about myself? And uh, yeah, then, you know, and everything kind of follows. I mean, you look in the mirror and you're like, damn, I look great, you know? <laughs> so then you feel really good. And, and it's so much more than everybody saying, oh, well, yeah, Lori, you look really good because they only see that, but they don't see the, the struggles, you know? And most struggles are when we're by ourselves, you know, in front of the bag of chips or in front of the cookies or, you know, saying to yourself like why am I doing this to myself when you're so tired or de- depleted and you're only on that 1400 calories and you're eating that white fish for the eight billionth time and you're like I don't want to eat this or but then you know so I I think it's 100% mental that you really really learn a lot about what you can do mentally and and you grow a lot a lot. Well, speaking about looking in the mirror and saying, I look good. There's also the flip side of that where you're going to get body dysmorphia. I'm sorry. If you get in this sport, it's, it's just going to happen. Like I originally thought that it was like, Oh, only a few people might be affected by it. No, it's everyone. Everybody that does this has this. It is one of those things where I would have never, you know, I always thought that like, Oh, if I got in really good shape, you know, I would, you know, never have to worry about my body ever again. I was in really good. Sh- I was in really good shape for like four years of my twenties. No, it's, that's the complete opposite where it gets yeah. even worse. But how do you deal with the body dysmorphia? It's almost like you're never really satisfied. Um, and, you know, I I will say that the hardest part of the prep and the bodybuilding and everything is that. And it's afterwards because you get to that, you know, 8% body fat, you get on stage, you win this gold medal because in reality, they are judging the way you look, right? <laughs> so you have to get on stage feeling good about the way you look before you know, like these people are judging the way I look. And then, you know, I didn't win the pro card. So it took me about two weeks of uh, trying and everything to say like, Oh, I wasn't good enough. And then you have this reverse diet where you have to gain weight. And it is the most difficult mental part of my child's uh, hey, we got hey, we, hey! Shout out to one of <laughs> whoever that one there was. <laughs> my oldest uh, son. Yeah, I think that that part because when we, when we look in the mirror, we don't see what other people see, and you know we are never satisfied. Or we say like, "Oh my god, my abs don't show anymore," or you know, the I don't have the striation on my shoulder anymore, and you're like, you know, it sounds really stupid, but you say, "Oh my god, I'm so fat," but obviously you're not. <laughs> and, but that. I think that is 10 times worse than eating whitefish every single day for four months. And uh, I'm not going to lie. Like my competition was August 5th and I'm still struggling with it a lot. And that's so mental too, because you're never satisfied. Has it gotten easier at least since you started or is it still as bad as it was when you first started? I feel like this prep, um, my reverse dieting was 
it's the worst. And I don't know, I don't know why it was, you know, I don't know why it's so hard. And I, I almost feel like I need to see a therapist because I'm like, how do I, you know, you binge or you, you, because you haven't had those things in so long. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I don't see my abs anymore. I don't see this, or I don't look good, which you still do, but you, you feel like, um, you know, and I, I feel like this one was really tough and I don't, I don't know why this one was so much harder than the first, maybe the first is cause you know, it's new and it's, so you, you go through this thing and then the second one was a couple of months after. So I, I only reverse got it for like two weeks and then I was back on prep and then, uh, you know, this prep, I, I found it to be more difficult. I thought about the food so much more than the other prep. And the second I got off of the, the prep after the competition, um, you know, I am having binges and I am having a hard time with the food and the reverse diet and looking at myself now compared to my stage, which we all know we cannot keep that leanness. Every single competitor says, I'm going to stay this lean forever. And like, you know, everybody says it, but we can't, especially if we're a woman, it's not healthy. Right. So, but yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult. I find that's the most challenging part. It's, um, it's hard. Have you, being that you work in pastry, have you come up with alternatives for pastries, like putting protein in them or making like protein cupcakes or anything? Have you come up with things like that to make them at least healthier so you like don't have to completely cut yourself off? No. (laughs) I do have one protein bar that I did, um, which is really good, but I studied French pastry and uh, for me, I feel like if it's going to be dessert we're not going to have healthy. If we want a healthy dessert, we'll have fruit salad or an apple. But if we're going dessert and we're going all out, we're going butter, we're going sugar, we're going, you know, I've, I've touched on the gluten-free, not for me. I've touched on the keto. No, I've tried the, like the protein. And then I said, you know what? Let's have, let's make it a treat. If we're going to have that treat, it's going to be all out treat. So no, I refuse to make, and people said, oh, can you make less sugar or healthier this? And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I mean, you could be, because I've always said, well, the, I mean, if you could make food that tasted just the way it tastes now, but make it like protein or make it like healthy or something like that, you'd be like the first ever trillionaire. So you could, I mean, I, I don't get how they haven't come up with stuff like that yet, because you'd think with all the other inventions that they've made that like they could make maybe even just like a burger that tastes like the same, but like yeah. how they do the impossible burger, but it's like, no, it, it tastes like crap. Like it's not, it doesn't taste like uh, meat and stuff, but you know, Hey, it's trial and error, but we got to talk about posing. Cause that is one of the hardest things about this lifestyle. And most people do not understand that if they have zero background in the sport, they don't realize that for a lot of these guests, that is the hardest thing for them. What is your relationship like with posing? Well, when I decided to do this again, I'm not the girliest of girl. Like I have three sisters. I'm a twin. My twin sister is fashionista, but I have three sons who played football and all the sports. And so I'm not walking around in heels. Right. So the first posing class, because when I decided to compete as well, I didn't know what was involved either. And he says, well, you need posing lessons. I was like, okay, how hard could posing lessons be? Or like, whatever. Well, I got to this posing lesson and I put the shoes on and like my coach and my posing coach were like, what in the world are we going to do with you in six weeks? And I'm like, why? What's the problem? They're like, but you're not even a girl. I'm like, well, I don't girl well. (laughs) So uh, he says, well, usually, you know, posing is twice a week for half hour. He says, we got to see you every single day. So I did posing for an hour every single day. And I practiced at home. Because Is that dog just destroying the house? <laughs> he's a bell, like, like, oh, I'm that's what it is. I thought he's like, I thought he was like ripping China up or something like that. Like in the, yeah. like, like stuff. He rings the bell to go out. And oh, like, okay. Every- that's what that was. Yeah, I was. I was thinking, I was like, oh. God, is he breaking stuff or something? I was, I was like, yeah. Well, yeah. I was like, that's he definitely. He rings that's the de- bell, yeah. but like, they close the door. Yeah. No, no worries at all. There. now he's outside so. no problem again it's no worry again this uh-huh. is all edited to i'll edit out try to edit out most of the noise in the background and again it's no big deal and if anyone always has a problem with that i always tell them screw them you've never had a dog in your life so you don't understand but yeah he's, it's he's the king of our house so <laughs> ours is too and ours is about a tenth the size of the next smallest person there so you know that's just, yeah he's tiny old. Yeah, 
that's just how it goes. But with your poses, what is your favorite pose and what is your least favorite pose? Um, I don't know. I I really like all the poses, actually. I like the side pose because I do have a, the good shoulder cap. So when I would pose on the side, I have very vascular, so the veins would really come out. Um, I found the back pose was the most difficult one to master um, because you can't see the mirror, right? And um, But, yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed the the first prep. I found it very difficult because, again, I was so ungirly and the shoes and – um, but then as I did it and as I did it, and even like the first time I walked out on stage, my coach was like, what in the world just happened to you? You turned into a girl, you know, I mean, the, the hair and makeup helped too, but, um, I think I like all the poses. The, the back pose was the most difficult one to master, but to say that there's one that I like better than the other, uh, no, I like them all. I like them all. And what is that moment like for you when you get to walk up on that stage and show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on? Um, I have to say, the for the first competition, I was a little bit... I, I want to say I was really nervous, but it was more that I did not want to wear those three tiny little pieces of triangle material in front of an audience. Because I was like, you, you feel so exposed, you know? And um, there is a lot of judgment on bodybuilding. And people think it's like this show off thing, which I, I felt the same, but then getting up to the show and as I would practice more and be in this bathing suit in the middle of a full gym, um, I was like, it's not about this tiny bathing suit. And it's not about that. It's about the hard work. So the first time I did go out on stage, um, you really do have this confidence and this like, you know, I know how hard I worked. I think that's what's nice about this sport too is they call it competing and, and you know, you are you have competitors, but you don't feel like you're competing against them. Like everybody's competing together because everyone knows how hard this was. And, you know, maybe it was harder for others or, you know, and I I don't say, well, I'm a pastry chef, so this was really hard for me. I, I just like we'll give it to her though, because good God, well, you <laughs> you you can have that title at least from me at least. <laughs> it was it was a little more challenging, you know, but um, I think that's what's so beautiful about it is that you do have that confidence in knowing, like, damn, I worked so hard, and I'm showing that hard work, and then you know, uh, everyone else is also worked that hard and everyone knows like how difficult it was. So it's really not about competing against each other. And then I won. So that, that helped a little bit. <laughs> that always makes up for a lot of things, especially, you yeah. know, when, when they do call your name at the end, but like you said, you judge yourself. I mean, every bodybuilder is their own worst critic, but you're also in a sport where other people judge you as well. How do you deal with that mentally that it's just constant judgment? Um, different kind of judging, um, you know, like, yeah, I mean, the judges are judging on how you look, you know, oh, yeah. so, and I, obviously, obviously they're not gonna tell you like, oh, you're a piece of crap and stuff like that. And like, oh, you're, you're a horrible <laughs> person. Why are you even doing this? But yeah, you know, like I, if they I, did, I, that would make it more entertaining though. I, I will give them that idea I, though. Yeah, and stuff like <laughs> they had a running commentary in the back, you know, um, the judgment is difficult and, you know, again, that's where you grow a lot too, because people judge you because you don't drink or they judge you because you go to bed early or they judge you because when you go to Easter with your family and you bring your own food, um, you know, they're like, well, why aren't you? Or it's like the, Oh, you can just have a little bit or, Oh, this or, and at the beginning you kind of take it personally and it sucks and it hurts because then they kind of stop inviting you or they just, say stupid things like, you know, I don't, I don't drink. So they'll, they'll be like, well, then you can't come out. And I'm like, well, I can, you know, and they're like, well, you'd be the best person to just be a sober cab driver. And then, and then, and yeah. And then I have the excuse to just get absolutely plastered. Are you kidding me? You're my go-to person to go out with then. I'm the DD on the spot. Right. (laughs) But yeah, they don't, they don't understand. And they'll say like, um, well, you can't come out with us because you don't drink. And I'm like, well, what difference does it make what's in my glass? Like, I'm still fun. Um, 
you know, and then you get that everyone's cheersing and they're like, oh, no, it's bad luck to cheers with water. And you're like, oh, okay, well, who told you that? And you believe it. I'm like, fine, I won't cheers you. It's okay. That's when you just got to pop the shoulders out and be like, is this bad luck? Yeah. yeah just go on. <laughs> so that, that aspect was hard, but then you, you realize that it's, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. And they don't understand. And that's okay. Um, it, it's hard at the beginning. You do take it personally, but then as you do it, you say, you know, you know that they, they just don't get it and it's okay. It, like let them, and you, you lose the, you know, I did lose a few friends who just didn't get it. And, you know, cause they're like, well, you can't have fun if you're not drinking. And I'm like, well, <laughs> First of all, especially for women to just have that one friend that's sober and kind of like watch your back too and stuff like that and make sure nothing bad happens to you. And so, that's like, I don't get how that isn't like immediately in their minds, but let's just be completely honest with you. Like you're not the average looking woman. If you were to walk out, especially like sleeveless as you're getting ready for a prep, it's like being a mini celebrity. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. always sleeveless. <laughs> I never I, work at parties. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So it's like, you are going to draw people's attention. What is that like for you? Because a lot of people just find that so weird that like just the amount of attention that they get when they start competing and as the leaner that they get. Uh, you know what? It's funny because some people will comment and some comments will be the dumbest things you've ever heard. Again, that's, you know, I mean, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. And uh, some people are super nice about it. Like I've been stopped at grocery stores where people are like, wow, that, you know, good job. Like that's a lot of hard work. And you're like, oh, thank you. And then some people are like, oh, well, how many steroids are you on? And you're like, no, not. Just, just say all of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm always like, well, let me list them for you. Yeah. You know, or people, you know, you'll be out. Or just be the person that's like, wait, do you guys know anyone that has steroids? Please tell <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah, please tell me. I've been, I've lost it. I would just, I would troll them so badly. Yeah. Like, I'm natural. You know, some people are on, some people are not. I'm not. And like, I don't judge people that are on. I just at my age I preferred not to but everyone thinks you're on it because you're so you're like one guy said oh wow well, you're you're so jacked you look like a dude I'm like so only dudes are jacked and I was like okay uh, you know like there's always that's when you just got to respond to him what kind of dudes are you hanging out with then well I'm like if only dudes are jacked then what are you because you're not <laughs> yeah notice how it's almost always the non-jacked dudes that say stuff like yeah. That. yeah. Yeah, or you get the, well, you know, girls with muscles are so ugly, and you're like, oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, like people say, Like those people think that every woman is throwing themselves at them, so they're like, oh, I gotta get my, it's like, dude, like, I don't get people like that. That's just, that's just flabbergasting to me, where I just, yeah, I do not understand that, but what, is there a compliment that you've received that maybe stands out in your mind? Like, is there a certain moment that really, like a positive moment like that? You know what, I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of positive moments I mean, some people really are like wow you know they they genuinely want to know like wow like what would you do like they like you look great and um that's a lot of hard work it's and it's more like they notice the hard work than you know hey you look good um you know the people in my gym like the support system of people uh, that was the really positive you know um definitely but I mean look everyone likes getting compliments obviously you know so when you are out somewhere and somebody says like my gosh like you know especially when you're like super super lean towards the end people are like oh my god wow you look great or like hey are you competing or or how many weeks out are you you know and and they know and you're like and they're genuinely interested in what you're doing but you know things like that it really does give you this positive thing and I was actually at the grocery store and the guy that was working the cash came up to talk to me. And yeah, at the beginning, you're kind of like, Oh, what does this person want now? You know? And he was just like, well, like that's a lot of hard work. And, and he was going on and on. And as I left, I was getting in my car and I, I saw him running out of the store and I was like, Oh my God, what does this guy want? And he was a younger guy and he hands me this little pin and it was like this little guardian angel pin. And he's like, I just feel like I needed to give this to you. And I was like, wow, that's really nice. You know, and he's like, I mean, I'm, I'm not religious, but he was like, the, it's blessed from the church. And he's like, I just really felt like I wanted, like, you have to have it. And I was like, and he said, could you just please come back and tell me if you won your competition or not? 
And so I actually pinned it on the inside of my uh, suit. And uh, I still have to go back and tell them that I won. <laughs> Being that Quebec is like a little bit different culturally than most of the rest of Canada, do you think that you get different reactions in Quebec than maybe other parts of Canada when it comes to just people giving you comp, just people coming up and talking to you? Or is it different in other regions than Quebec? Um, I don't know. I feel like, um, like everywhere there's nice people and rude people and good people and stupid people. So, um, I don't know. Like, I mean, the competition was in Toronto, right. And I've, I've, I've been to Toronto and I've traveled a few other places while I was on prep. Uh, I was actually in Dominican Republic for a one week all inclusive on prep. Uh, and, uh, there too, there was, that might of- be the most crazy thing you've ever done. Not even the pastry chef and yeah, that was that was that was a hard one, <laughs> but it was like, wow, well, well, whatever. I'm, you my coach is like, why? But yeah, same thing there. Like you get the compliments or the the you know you get the stupid people. You get the so no, I can't really say that in in Quebec. And a lot of the competitors that were in Toronto in the the whole Canadian thing were from Quebec as well. So yeah, no, I can't really say that it's. Uh, I mean, we, we all have our, our morons in everywhere where we live. <laughs> Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And what is your relationship like with cardio? Because that is a demon from hell that I want expelled, but unfortunately it's a necessary evil. I 100% agree with you. I freaking hate it. I hate it. And my coach had me on spinning for, I was like, oh, who and people, I'm like, people do these spinning classes like willingly and they're like, we love this. And I'm like, why? No, I don't, I don't like cardio. And I'm, I'm lucky. I'm a lucky competitor. I have to say I had 25 minutes of cardio five times a week. There were girls that were doing two hours of cardio every day. Um, now I do 30 to 40 minutes of, you know, incline treadmill. And um, I, I see these competitors like, oh, I still have to do my two hours of cardio. And I'm like, two hours. <laughs> Kill me now. No, thanks. No, I don't like cardio at all. It is, yeah, it is definitely not a highlight. I do, I still go on walks every night and it's just, walks are fine though. Like I can, I can definitely tolerate walks, but like doing like, yeah, doing the the cardio. And that spinning bike and the, ugh. Yep. I train very early in the morning. So um, when I get on the treadmill or like the spinning bike, there's, there's nobody around. So you know, you watch a video or this or whatever, but it's boring as all hell. And, and I don't, and I would always say like, Oh, at the end of this, I'm going to like cardio. And then I'm like, no, don't like it yet. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I, I, the only people that I've talked to that like actually enjoy cardio are the ones that are either like former track stars or just absolutely just enjoy the feeling of nothingness. Cause yeah, it is so boring. I have to, I have my audio books on whenever I'm going on my walks and you have to at least entertain yourselves some way, but what piece of advice would you have for someone who would walk up to you and say, you know, Lori, I really want to get started on my fitness journey, but I just don't know how. Um, you know what? It's, it's tough because a lot of people ask me for advice and a lot of people ask me for help. Now I, I do also have a personal training certificate, so I could train people. Um, but I choose not to because they don't have the mindset like it starts in your head and if if somebody comes up to me and wants advice I would say when you have your mind 100% in it to start and you know you're going to stick to it that's it's the only way it's the only way because everyone's like yeah, I'm gonna start on Monday I'm gonna start on Monday don't start on Monday start right now and like make it a habit and stick to it because a lot of people are like, well, you know, I tried, but, or, or, you know, I couldn't eat all the rice. It's too much or, or, and you're like, no, you're not ready. You're not ready. So you have to be ready because everybody says they want to do it. Um, everybody, I'm not generalizing here, but, and I did it too. I, I'm 100% guilty when I first went to see my coach, um, I wasn't ready and, and he gave me the meal plans and he gave me, and I, I would come up with all these excuses and, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastry chef. This is hard. This is hard. And and he would say it like, that's excuse. That's excuse. And I remember I told him to F off one day and I came home and I was like, who does this guy think he is telling me that this is not that hard, you know? And then I went back to him and I said, you were right. It was all excuses. 
because when you really want to do it, you're going to do it. And I think that's the advice that I would give to people is I'm, if you're not a hundred percent ready, like even like you have to start even when you're not ready and make it a habit. But if your mind is not in it, then you, you're not going to be able to do it. You have to put your mind in it first and just don't give up. Like never, ever, ever stop. And especially on the days where it sucks and you don't want to do cardio and you don't want to do it, you get up and you still do it and um, never stop. Like, don't quit. Absolutely. And how has this bodybuilding impacted your family? Because I could imagine, like you said, you have sons that all play football. So obviously they do some workouts. But if I had a mom that was jacked, I honestly would just be, that'd be the biggest motivation of all time. Because like, I'm not going to let my mom be a bit better than me at stuff. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I would be in the gym constantly. But how has your training impacted your your family? Well, my, my, I think my kids' friends think I'm cool. My, my kids don't think I'm cool yet. Uh, I do, I have my older son that did start the gym recently. Um, I'm moving because my battery is going to die. No worries. Uh, they, like my youngest is 15. My middle one is 17. He's the middle child. He's kind of. Like, they care, but they don't. So they're not super into it yet. My older one came to the gym with me once. And somebody asked if... Someone commented that I go to the gym with my boyfriend. It's so cute. And he was so angry because he was like, that's my mother. <laughs> that he never came back to the gym with me. I, I also go to the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning. So he's like, no, I'm not coming with you. He's like, you're a crazy woman. <laughs> so... um it didn't really, uh, you know, I mean, the food and everything has an impact on them. They, they don't want to eat chicken and broccoli, obviously, but, um, I see the influences right now. They're teenagers too. So it's not important to them. Um, but my older one just started again back and we'll, we'll see. I really hope it will catch on as much as they're teenagers. Just give them a new Xbox and lock them in their room. They'll be fine. You know, I well, I recently won a PS5, so now they have one, so they they can they can hang out with that. But um, I, I really want it to rub off on them, but I don't want to force it on them either. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll see. Just Jill Sergeant, it just start banging pans in front of yeah. them at like four a.m. Get them up, yeah. You never you, you never know, but yeah, that's. I mean, there's been so many studies that have proven that the more healthier the parents are, the more likely it is that the kids are going to pick up on it as well. So just even having that positive influence, you know, would really help. But when you look at your program, what is one exercise that if you look at, you're like, Oh my God, that's amazing. This is going to be great. And then what's one exercise that if you look at, you're like, I want to kill my coach. I hate the hack squat. I like every time I have to hack squat, I'm like, I can't stand it. I, I don't know what it is, but the hack squat is my nemesis. And when I see it on my paper, I'm always like, oh, God, no, the hack squat. Um, And uh, I like everything else. (laughs) I really like training legs and I like training back. Um, But uh, that hack squat is just, I love, love, love rack pull. And um, I love all back stuff, actually. But um, oh, I had to hack squat today. and, And it just... You know, uh, and everybody knows I hate it too. And and I train legs with a buddy of mine, and he's like, you know what time it is? I'm like, no, don't. And during my prep, when I was so 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 depleted, and I couldn't get up to the same weights I was doing, I would cry. I would would literally cry at the end. Yeah. So maybe now in the bulk of the hex squat might uh, become a little bit easier, but. And that's the other thing, too, is I do it anyways, because even though I hate it and it sucks, part of it. Well, and being like whenever I have a guest that has like a one muscle group that's so much more pronounced than everything else, like your shoulders, do you ever struggle at all with like the urge to maybe just train them a little bit more? Just because whenever someone has a body part that's that pronounced, a lot of times just deep down, they're just like, OK, that, that looks so nice. I kind of want to get it bigger. Have you ever struggled with that? Because I have met people that just they have a body part that just is so pronounced that they literally can't train it for like over a year just to get everything to try to catch up oh like i would train shoulders every single day and it's so vain because i'm like ooh, i like looking in the mirror when i i see like the shoulder pump and i'm like oh man it looks so good you know 
and my back too. Like I have, a, I, I have to say, I, you know, a, I have a, a very well defined back. So, um, and well, my split right now is I do everything once a week except legs. I do legs twice a week because that's where I need the most work. But yeah, the the shoulders. Def- I would definitely overtrain my shoulders just because I like the way it looks. Hey, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if someone were to walk up to you and say, Laura, you made the decision, you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. Will be one thing you'd like to see changed. Oh, uh, the cost, <laughs> the cost. Oh my God. Um, it costs a lot of money to do a show. Um, and you don't win any money. Uh, I don't think I would need to win money, but um, maybe you know the the cost is a lot. But eh, it wouldn't deter me. It wouldn't deter me from doing it. If I could change one thing, it would definitely be the judgment about it. The judgment. What about the judgment? Um, you know what it is too. It's funny because, like, as a bodybuilder and as a person who meal preps and watches what I eat and you know, does all these things. I don't look at what other people eat or at what other people do, or if people don't go to the gym, I don't, I don't like, it's not my, my problem, right? Because I'm so focused on my goal and doing what I need to do for myself that you can do whatever you want. So I would change that, you know, everyone thinks I'm on a diet or I'm, you know, if I am at my son's basketball game and I take out my meal and the lady sitting next to me is having chips and a Pepsi, she has to ask me a million questions about why I'm eating this food. And, you know, I'll kind of let them talk and then I'll say, well, you know, if I was sitting here eating pizza and drinking a Pepsi, you would have not asked me anything. So I don't, and that's because they feel judged because I'm sitting there eating healthy food. I'm not on a diet. I'm eating a proper diet. So I I would definitely change the, the judgment that everyone thinks because I eat healthy, I'm on a diet and like mind your business. I, I don't care that you're eating chips and, and Pepsi and, and why is it so important for people to, you know, pick apart what we're doing and that, that we don't drink or that we don't, um, you know, we don't judge the other people. We don't care. <laughs> I mean, everybody should eat healthier and every, everyone should, if everyone ate properly and only had treats, nobody would ever be on a diet. Like the word diet would mean exactly what it means. So yeah, I would definitely take that judgment away that, you know, there's, there's something wrong with us because we're not sitting there eating French fries and, and all these things. Trust me, we want to eat it, (laughs) but we choose to eat it every now and then as a treat. And we stay on a meal plan, which is just a healthy diet. It's not anything special. Um, I would change that because you do feel like you're outcast because you're not, you know, overeating a whole bunch of stuff that's not good for you. When you mentioned not really caring about what a lot of others think, but unfortunately with Instagram, it's, I think it's really helped take off, you know, the bodybuilding sport a lot, yeah. but it's, it would be so hard for me if I was in a competition and not just know if I knew who I was competing against and not just sort of check in on them every once in a while and just be like, what is, what are they doing? What do they look like? Did you ever struggle with that? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And at the end I stopped looking because we all follow each other and, and we don't, we don't follow each Well, maybe some people are checking out because. I think that was my my challenge this year too is because I won last year and I was going back I was like well I I have to win again I'm not going back to get second place you know so I'm like people are obviously going to be checking on me because they know that they're coming there to beat me and so I I I was kind of looking at others. And then at one point I stopped myself. I said, don't look at anybody anymore because in your head, you're like, Oh my God, wow. Look at her. Oh shoot. Like she's that, that low body fat. She looks good. Cause people will be posting like, Oh, I'm at this body fat. And I'm like, I don't want to know. Like, I don't want anybody to know. And like, I would post stuff too, but I said, you know, 
And like at one point, my coach too was like, you know, don't don't show what the package you're bringing. And I said, but uh, yeah, I had to stop looking because it does get in your head. Like, oh my god, her legs are better than mine. Oh, look at her abs. Oh, look at how she looks. Am I gonna win again? Because like she's coming up and she looks great. So I totally stopped looking at people's stuff because it was affecting me a little bit. So I honestly think I would stop doing some shows just because I'd be like. I can't compete against that. What am I doing? So yeah, it, like I said, it's helped out fitness, but it's also kind of been, you know, a hindrance, but in your opinion, what makes a coach a good coach? Because unfortunately from what I've discovered from talking to so many people is that there are a lot more bad coaches than there are good coaches just because I think a lot of people fall prey to that person who might, you know, have done one show and then they're like, Oh, I'm so knowledgeable now. Like follow me. But for a, being a good coach, it really does impact people in different ways. Some people might want the drill sergeant. Some people might want the best friend. But in your own personal journey, what, in your opinion, makes a coach a good coach? Uh, that's a super question because, yeah, like I, I kind of need a mix of everything. I do need the drill sergeant, but I'm a very emotional person. So you you do need somebody that understands. And You're think, Italian. Come on. <laughs> there you go. You know, I'm Italian <laughs> and I'm a girl. So um, you, you need somebody that first of all, they got to be there for you because you're, you're investing so much time into this and, um, they're going to get to know you really well. You know, like there's, there's certain things you have to tell them. I mean, you know, there's certain things that they, they have to, to know so that they, you know, I mean, the diet and this and that, how's it affecting you? How's this? How's that? If, if you mess up, you have to call them, you have to trust them because the first time I did a show and he was telling me, you know, you need to eat cheesecake now. And I was like, what's wrong with you? Why would you make me eat cheesecake? Like, this is crazy, you know? Um, so you really have to trust them that they know what they're doing. And um, there is the, the friend aspect. I think you do end up becoming friends with them, but there's also the drill sergeant. Like, um, you know, my coaches were, were, I can say he's definitely a friend. Like his, his gym is very family and, you do feel like it's part of a family thing and they are there for you a hundred percent. Um, and when I did walk out on stage the first time and I came backstage, he started yelling at me and he's like, what was that? And, and it caught me and he's like, I know you're going to cry right now. He's like, don't cry. Don't put it in emotion. Get mad, get mad and bring it back. And then he was like, okay, sorry, Lori. You know, he was like, I know that really hurt, but he's like, that's what you needed to hear right now. I'm like, no, you're right. You know? So I think that makes a good coach too, that they can step back from the friendship and be like, this is what you have to do. Like you don't have a choice. And, you know, when you are at the end depleted and you're sitting in his office crying and because it's hard, he's going to be like, it's okay. You could do this. Like, I think my coach believed I could do it way before I did because he kept saying, no, you got this, you got this. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And he was like, you're going to win. You're going to win. And he believed it more than I did. So I think it's important to have that bond with your coach too. For me, at least, like that's what I needed, you know, and listen, maybe some people just need somebody to kick their ass every single day. And, you know, I, I did the workouts on my own. So it wasn't really, I didn't really need that part. For me, it was more the emotional that he was there for me. And, uh, you know, when I did mess up, I would shoot him a text and say like, oh, you know, I'm sorry I did this. and it's, it's, he would be like, yeah, you suck, but it's okay. Like, let's move on. You can't change it now. This is what we're going to do. So I think that, you know, the coach has to be a hundred percent present. And, um, I guess it's, well, that's why it's personal training, right? Because like people say personal training, oh, you have a trainer that's personal for you. No, sure. it's personally tailored to you and even an emotion because they'll get to know you and, I'm, I know I'm way more emotional than some of his other competitors <laughs> because I'm always backstage crying, you know? Um, and so they, they really, really getting to know you and, and making it personal for you makes a good coach for sure. Yeah. You just have to be incredibly intuitive as well. Like you need to be yes. such a good judgment of a person because yeah, like when you were, when that, when he was kind of telling you to not cry and suck it up on the stage, like you need to have that judgment in a person where you're just going to be able to tell, instead of just being like, Oh my God, are you all right? This is, you just need to know when it's appropriate when it's not, which is a skill. It's definitely something that very few people I would imagine, especially in the coaching, you know, industry have, but 
when we do have you on a year from now, because I'd love to talk to you again in a year, where would you like to be at in your bodybuilding? Where would you like to be at in your overall life? What, even your pastry career, what are some goals that you'd like to have achieved when we have you on a year from today? Well, uh, a year from today, I will have done my next competition, and I'm hoping to have that pro card. I'm going to have the pro card. That's what I'm. That, that's my goal for next August. I'm getting that pro card. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to work my ass off all year because that's what I want. And you know what? I might never do anything with pro card. I might hang it on my wall. I don't know. It's in a year from now. But all I know is that I do want it. That's my goal. Um, pastry wise, I just started working a new job right before the, um, the competition, which I really, really enjoy. So, you know, who knows where that will take me. Um, and hopefully my kids will be a little bit more in the gym in a year. We'll work on that. But, um, uh, no, you know what, that, I just, um, I'm working towards the pro card right now and, um, I know it's in a year and um we'll see what happens but i'll definitely like talk to you again next year to tell you i got my pro card (laughs) absolutely and how just lastly how do you deal with the fact that this is not a sport of immediate gains like this is a sport it takes time it takes i mean any other sport you'd see results much much sooner than you really would for bodybuilding how do you deal with that? Just the time commitment that you have to have, because so many people, when they look at some of these competitors, they don't understand that it's for a lot of them. It's like decades of an incredible hard work. It's not something that you can just do over a summer. No. Um, you know what? We were talking about that this morning because my gym partner, uh, like I'm 44, my gym partner is 21 and he's just starting, you know, and, uh, he has a really good genetic and I keep telling him, Oh, you should compete. You should compete. But you know, he says, well, you know, I, I have to build for two years and then I can do it, you know? And I was on the, the, like, I only started competing last year and I said, I'm not doing this forever. I want to get a pro card before I turn 45. So, you know, I feel like, but I worked out for 10 years to get to this point. So yeah, delayed gratification. It's not easy because people start and I think that's the problem that most people have is they don't see results right away and they give up. But, you know, for someone who's 19, 20 years old, starting now saying, I want to be a bodybuilder, you have to build your body before you can get to a show or, you know, building muscle. It does take time and it's not, it's not easy because I know that I'm going to work out my back for the next month and it's not going to change. It's only going to change after we bulk and this and that. And I did three shows and the difference in my physique in those three shows was like night and day. But yeah, the the time is the hardest thing. And I think that's where your mind gets in it too, is that it's not going to be overnight and it's not going to be easy. And if you're not willing to make those sacrifices, then forget it. You can't do it. Yep, Exactly. And that's just the dedication that and the motivation that, really just I get from doing all this is just how these people are just so dedicated and motivated in their sport. And yeah. And was there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? Well, definitely want to give a shout out to my coach, big daddy fitness for sure. He's phenomenal. His name's Nico. What a great coach. He has been really there for me. And, uh, you know, my, my family has been, um, uh, at the beginning didn't really understand, but really came along. Um, my kids, my kids are my fan club. I could never, ever do any of this without them. And definitely my training, my training partner, Antoine, the poor kid is 21 years old. You must think I'm the most psychotic, weird 44 year old woman ever. And I mean, please tell me you bake him some pastries every once in a while. Absolutely. I will. (laughs) Yeah. I told him I take care of all the cheat meals. No problem. You know, but, um, he said the other day, if someone would have said like, my training partner is going to be like a 44 year old woman. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, hey, listen, <laughs> it's what it is. So he pushes me every day. Uh, he's fantastic. Really, really smart, mature kid. So definitely him. And a shout out to you, man. Thank you so much for for having me on. It's really great. My pleasure. Absolutely. And everyone, go and give her a, a look on her Instagram page. Buyer beware. You will have some food porn and you will also be inspired to get off that co- couch and stop eating all that all those pastries really, which uh, it's a, it's a conundrum looking at her page really, because you're drooling half the time at the food. And then the other time you're just, your jaws dropped and you're like, how is she even doing this? So, <laughs> but again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Can't wait to speak to you again. 
Absolutely. All right, everyone. This is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.